All right, let's do another topic that actually also sort of throws tradition into the air mm-hmm. and readdresses things. Um, this article isn't quite as robust as the one we did on the pneumothorax. This one has a little bit more trouble, but it does broach a topic that yeah. I think needs to be broached. It's outpatient treatment of low-risk pulmonary embolism in the era of direct oral anticoagulants, a, sy- a systematic review. Now, this is basically the idea that we know that PE is like the bane of everyone's existence. We don't want to miss it. We know it kills people. We know we'd overdiagnose a lot of them. We're not sure that the treatment we have is just like the worst treatment awfulness as far as side effects and harm. And the whole thing is just a mess. We know it causes morbidity and mortality. We know that a lot of things contribute to risk. We know, though, that not everyone with a PE is super, super sick. Mm -hmm. We know that a lot of people, if they're they're hemodynamically stable, the likelihood of dying is not in nothing. Thing, but it's not super high. So right. it's about four to five percent. And if we use scoring systems, to try to pick mm-hmm. out the even, can we drive that lower? P, mm-hmm. Somebody with a PE, but drive that risk lower. We use like the PESI score, the Hestia criteria. We can even find a subset that is even lower risk, a half to two percent ish yes. of dying of their PE, basically a mortality risk that's much lower. And it turns out a lot of people fit there. Yeah. So can we find those people that we can yeah. say, you know, go home? Yeah. Like you can get, tra- we have these great drugs we can treat you now yeah. with oral anticoagulants. Go home Let's with this thing. It. And by the way, people who are from Canada, if you happen to be from Canada listening to this, I apologize. You've been doing this forever. <laughs> We're a little slow. So we know we, we treat outpatient VTE, you know, venous thromboembolic disease, a lot with DVT. Mm-hmm. We send them home all the time. We just don't do it with PE. And somehow we got in this idea that, oh, my gosh, it's in your lung. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, we have to keep you around. Yeah. And we did know that there was this idea of when we had people on warfarin, we had to bridge them to make sure they were ad- anticoagulated before they went home. Well, that's now gone. Right. We, we use a d- direct oral anticoagulant. You're anticoagulated within a short amount of time of taking the dose. Really brings up the idea that outpatient treatment is pretty easy yeah. to do, at least logistically. Right. The and question it's is, finding those patients is where it, it's okay. Yeah. Is it yeah. safe? Which patients is it safe? So this paper said, let's see what's out there. Let's go look at what the data is. Let's see what's out there for outpatient PE, t- PE treatment using oral anticoagulants, particularly do- direct oral anticoagulants. So it's a systematic review. They did the, all the typical stuff, looking at all the studies out there, and they had some criteria. They wanted prospective studies, mm-hmm. adults, radiographically diagnosed acute symptomatic PE. So they had to have an imaging study. And they had to be symptomatic. Uh, they had to be symptomatic, exactly. Yeah. And they were discharged. So this is a bunch of people that went home um, mm-hmm. that, or within for, either from the ED or within 48 hours of admission. They included randomized controlled trials. And because there weren't a lot of those, they also included non-randomized prospective trials. So everything else was excluded. So, and they were based, and they, they ahead of time had listed seven chosen outcomes, including adverse things, good things and adverse things, mm-hmm. as far as what they were looking for on the study. They came out with 12 studies. I'm always amazed when they do these systematic reviews. You know, we went through 12,000 million hundred you know, studies and we <laughs> came up with 12. Yeah. Four randomized controlled trials, eight were non-randomized trials, six used DOACs, and three of them used them exclusively. They didn't compare them to something like Warfarin. They used DOACs only. Mm-hmm. The risk scoring, which is what we'd love, I would wish all of them had done it. Yeah. They didn't. Yeah. Two of them didn't score. The other 10, though, did. They u- either used the PESI score or the Hestia score. And I think we want to find some way to be all on the same page mm-hmm. here. So using a score would be useful. Mm-hmm. And then they also, the, the studies were quite heterogeneous as far as what type of anticoagulation, yeah. what outcomes were reported, and the adverse outcomes that were reported. So this is this is where these reviews get messy. And I give kudos to people that try to make them useful to us in trying to mix this messy data together. But mm-hmm. we'll talk about what they found and what they didn't in this particular study. So... All cause mortality. So this is basically just somebody who died. All cause mortality. Mm -hmm. In general, in this particular study, this was about 3,100 patients total when they put all the people together. It was uncommon at 30 days in general. And it makes sense, right? These are people you felt comfortable sending home. These Mm -hmm. are people who went home by definition. So it was up up to 1.7%. So that's in that low risk category that I think most of us would be okay with. Um, 90 days, it was a little bit higher. So 30 days was up to 1.7%. 90 days, it was up to 3.6%. So it's a little bit dicey up the 90 days, but it's okay. This is all cause, by the way. This isn't just PE mortality. Um, What they found is the overall 30-day mortality, if you were on a DOAC or a VKA, so you were either on warfarin or DOAC, Mm -hmm. 30 days was virtually nothing. 90 days, it was a little bit less than 1%, and it wasn't statistically significant. So this is overall mortality. Again, the studies range. Remember, we're doing 12 studies we're going to cram together. If you crammed it all into one piece of data, it's the risk was low, Mm -hmm. less than 1% if you took, crammed it all into sort of one thing. 
the outcomes related to PEs themselves were actually uncommon, which is interesting actually, which tells you that people who get PEs have other stuff. Yeah. Or there's other reasons that, whatever the reason they had their PE, maybe what killed them eventually. This one, PEs themselves though, it was uncommon to have a PE related mortality at 30 days, less than 0.6% so was the highest. 90 days, 0.4%, we're down to low. And it didn't make any difference if you had warfarin or a DOAC. It didn't make any difference which of those oral treatments you had. Recurrent PE, so this is not mortality PEs. This is now you just get another PE. Mm -hmm. Overall at 30 days, it was up to about 1.4%. And up to 90 days, it was up to about 2-ish percent. Um, but if you were on an anticoagulant, if you were on a VKA or a DOAC, it was low. It was less than 1% mm -hmm. in both of those at 30 days. It was about 1% on warfarin at 90 days, but still a half a percent on a DOAC. And those, those differences were not statistically significant. That's important. It looks like, right. oh, wow, it's three times as high. No, it's still it's statistically like small. And tiny, smaller. tiny, yeah. exactly, tiny, tiny. We also want to know the bad things that can happen. So mm -hmm. I'm going to send you home on these bad kinds of drugs. Are you going to bleed? And overall, the bleeding risk was really less than 2% all the way out to 90 days. And that actually is pretty commensurate with anybody who's on these meds, mm -hmm. frankly, no matter whatever reason you're on it. For That's just these meds. The 30-day bleeding, again, was really less than 1%. And both types of agents, 90 days, less than 1%, both types of agents, basically either one, either warfarin or a DOAC, the bleeding risk was pretty much the same and it was very low overall. Mm -hmm. Major adverse events just overall, the big stuff. with the And this includes the bleeds and the readmissions and all the things that they had on their list of seven things. Warfarin was the worst. Um, it was basically, it was 2.8% over a DOAC, which is 1.5%. But again, remember, statistically, that that is equivalent. So even though it looks, the number looks worse, statistically, it's equivalent. So right so far, everything we're finding yeah. is equivalent, warfarin to DOAC, and the numbers themselves are pretty low across the board of all the bad stuff. ED revisits were a little different. ED revisits um, basically were, if you sent someone home, people sometimes came back with something for whatever reason came back for an ED visit. Um, up to at 90 days, one in five people who was sent home came back for another visit. But these people who have, you have a PE, there's other stuff going on in your life. So mm -hmm. it, it wasn't just a PE visit, revisit. And then re-hospitalization, um, it was up to 10% at 90 days. So the, that tells me that these people are high risk people, but this particular PE event may not be high risk for the moment of sending them home. Mm -hmm. So these are just high risk people in general. Mm -hmm. So the three major fi findings that they found, basically when they looked at their, their things that they were focusing on, the three things they came out of this paper were, there aren't a lot of great studies. <laughs> So that's one thing. We know that if this sounds as good as it looks, if it works out as well, we, we could benefit 100,000 people that don't need to be in the hospital. And that's a lot of people. But we really need really good trials of this. We need to try different anticoagulants. The DOAC that was used in most of these studies was rivaroxaban. It wasn't compared to any other DOAC. It wasn't compared very well to, to VKAs in some of the studies. Mm -hmm. So we need to look at this better, randomized controlled trials, to see really what works and what doesn't. We do know, though, that in this group, this group that went home, that was felt safe to go home, there were low risks of ma major adverse events. They just were low risks of serious outcomes. And w we can figure out who these people are. We can do a HESI, a, a HESTIA score. We can do a PESI score. We can find the people that are in that low risk category, mm -hmm. and we can probably safely send them home. Yeah. It looks like that's sort of the, the sort of deal here. And there really was no, in sending them home, there weren't, at least in this systematic review, any really statistically significant differences in bleeding rates, in sort of general outcomes, and choosing what you send them home on should really be individualized to the individual here. Now, there were definitely limitations on this study. And, and I, I always, always, always look at the limitations section of every paper because mm -hmm. I will, that'll tell me if that's an insightful author group. If they don't list very many, I'm worried about the study in the first place. Right. And if they do list ones that make sense, that this is where we go further with our research, right? So we there's we don't have a lot of randomized control trials. We don't haven't tested a bunch of different kinds of DOACs out there. We don't have a lot of bad events. So maybe we need a much more gigantic study to exactly. see is there really a difference in these? So when there's tiny numbers, you need bigger study numbers mm -hmm. to find the the the, the rare things. The rare things. Yeah. So and we know that confounders. If somebody has a PE, it's usually for a reason. Right. You know, so is it a cancer that's the problem? Is it so why is, is somebody hypercoagulable? Why is this happening? So the conclusion of this particular paper said that controlled trials are lacking, but it looks like there's a group of patients that have a low morbidity and low mortality to be sent home with PE from mm -hmm. the emergency department. Um, and we need better trials in this. So in their study, 
low risk of mortality in the, in the specific group they studied, low risk of mortality, low risk of recurrent PE, low risk of major bleeding at 90 days, and no apparent difference in what anticoagulant was used, a VKA or a DOAC. So this, frankly, I think if you're sending people home in the yeah. right category, good to go, good on you. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have more robust data coming down the line. But I think this is certainly, and I'll tell you, yeah. our Canadian friends I think we're way yeah. behind the behind anyway. This has always made me a little bit nervous. Like I've known it's an option, but now I feel a little more reassured in this literature that it's okay. If right. they're low risk, you know, use SPESI or something, save that on your phone. If they're low risk, you can connect them to appropriate follow-up. You give them good return precautions. This is and a you give them a DOAC where you know they're antiquated when they walk out the door. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, by the way, make sure they can get the DOAC. Oh, yeah. Those are can't. expensive. Oh, yeah. They're expensive. Yeah. Some insurance companies won't cover them. Exactly. Make sure that they can get the DOAC. So. Correct.